Yep. Um, so wel welcome everybody um, to the 10th um, um, educational uh, lecture series um, between uh, Janila Research Lab and um, John Gooden School. So today I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Liz Gardner from the John Kennedy School of Medical Research um, to present um, and, and educate us really on how to uh, it, how clot works and um, and and how clot uh, would probably uh, allow us to live uh, if it doesn't go really bad. Um, so Liz uh, has an extremely um, uh, you know, deep history uh, in platelet uh, biology. Um, but of course, before, beyond that, um, she's um, taken on a more um, a senior role now at the, the John Curtin School. She's currently the deputy director, and she has been involved um, in many translational work. Uh, uh, apart from the papers she's published, um, she, I think she has a real keen uh, uh, interest in, in how to translate you know, scientific um, um, tools uh, and scientific um, um, papers into clinical decision and outcome. So I think uh, one of the key findings that she's been, uh, she's observed in her, her work was that the receptor-based um, uh, processes that are triggered by just mechanical flow. And, and I think uh, today's talk will pretty much be providing us with a, a really, uh, hopefully a very good working knowledge of clotting. And I think for those in the audience, um, clotting, it's been a big um, news coming up, um, especially with the COVID uh, situation. I think learning a lot more about clots would help us understand those, those uh, health um, uh, ramifications. So, so Liz, please take away. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, so understanding the process of clot formation with the view to um, stopping it, slowing it down, and I hope to sort of show that uh, the um, most of the tools that we have available in the clinic to prevent these sorts of processes are, um, have major bleeding side effects. So um, that's where... I sort of sit in that um, nexus of trying to understand the process by which these little guys, platelets, go from a uh, resting. Can, can you see my um, cursor, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, the platelets go from a resting to an active state. Um, <clears throat> so platelets uh, circulate in the blood. They are the second most abundant entity in the blood after the red cell. Um, but they're the, the smallest. So just for comparison down here, um, looking at uh, beautiful scanning EM images of a red cell, a white cell, and um, a somewhat activated platelet, we can see that they're um, relatively tiny. So there's our first imaging challenge, right, in a, this imaging talk. We want to try and image something which is... Um, we in this resting state are uh, difficult to um, monitor. Once we activate it, there's lots of ways that we can um, uh, monitor uh, the activated platelet. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that um, I've done um, primarily with Steve Lee's group um, to look at some of the molecular processes going from a resting to an activated platelet without the need of labeling. So just a little bit of background. Um, uh, platelets have no nucleus, so they don't have any uh, DNA. They do carry RNA, mitochondria, ribosomes, and all the um, machinery needed to make protein. So they and they people have shown they can actually make de novo protein, but generally they're born from the bone marrow with fully complete with everything that they need to perform uh, their roles in hemostasis. So they have um, many granules uh, that we can take advantage of, both as, a, as sentinels for uh, going from the resting to an activated state, um, and also uh, as uh, measuring markers of activity. So the release of some of these reagents uh, can be very useful. They're not just a uh, ball of, um, you know, a smooth shaped ball like that. They actually have what's called an open canalicular system, which is a highly organized membrane structure that they can adjust and change at, at will generally to the um, blood uh, rheology conditions, so the parameters in the bloodstream. 
And they do this by manipulating um, a, a cytoskeleton that uh, controls uh, the folds of the membranes. And uh, so uh, this enables the platelet to cluster receptors, for example, to degranulate, so to remove, to move um, intracellular vesicles to the external surface and then either release them or expose proteins on the surface of the platelet. Um, and it, it's a very intricate and rapid system. So that's the other reason that I really like um, to work on them, that it's quite quick. The experiments are relatively quick. We don't have to wait days and days for things to happen. So these are just some um, nice uh, images taken by Aman, um, Aman Kao in, in my group. Uh, looking at a resting platelet and then platelets that are exposed either to a natural ligand, collagen, and so they have a bunch of receptors on the surface that allow the platelet to respond to collagen, a couple of different magnifications, or exposure to shear. And I hope everyone can see just immediately um, from these images, there's clear differences between engaging a platelet's activation processes by a receptor ligand interaction or by exposure to um, a high level of shear stress. So 3000 inverse seconds, that would be quite a high level. It's not um, uh, beyond the physiological range, but it's at the higher end of the physiological range. And we can see without any ligand, just exposing platelets to shear in, in the laboratory, I'll discuss that in a minute, we can induce um, a very rapid uh, clotting or clumping or aggregating of the platelet, um, the platelet events. So these single entities rapidly stick together to form a blood clot. So this is just shown um, as a bit of a cartoon. Uh, stepwise, platelets circulate um, uh, in a very quiescent state until they are exposed they detect a site of injury, and that could be exposure of an extracellular matrix protein, or it could be a bacterial infection. But this induces the platelets to first of all, slow down and roll across this injury, eventually stop um, and activate, recruit more platelets and form a, an aggregate that begin, that is the initial step of the wound healing process. So my um, uh, focus of my, my work has generally been around uh, the structure function of the engagement of these receptors that are responsible for this slowing down and adhesion state. So the receptors we'll talk about today are the term glycoprotein 6, so this is Roman numerals for 6, and glycoprotein GP1B95 complex. Um, primarily glycoprotein 6 binds collagen, and this complex glycoprotein 1B95 binds von Willebrand factor, both of which are present in the blood vessel wall. And I've studied this interaction and then the immediate um, signaling pathways that lead to this step, the aggregation step, which is the uh, upregulation of an integrin dedicated on, only on, found on platelets that binds primarily fibrinogen. And so you get this um, aggregates forming through engagement of these pathways, these signaling events, and I've simplified them here, there's a, a numerous steps involved leading to the upregulation of the integrin. <clears throat> so um, oh, just a quick word on uh, shear stress. So I mentioned already that platelets um, will respond to collagen or are a ligand of, of one of those receptors, but they'll also respond to vascular shear stress. So this is just a simple, um, introductory slide um, just showing a beautifully smooth blood vessel that now um, has some type of narrowing of the lumen. And so the um, shear stress is given by these equations that relate to the viscosity of the blood, which is primarily driven by the red cell component, the velocity of flow, the flow rate, and the radius of the vessel that, um, that the blood is is um, moving through. And we can see here that as long as these two uh, values remain basically the same, simply altering the um, vessel lumen size, narrowing the lumen, dramatically increases the shear stress that the platelets will, um, will fear. And so that is why in, for example, um, a coronary vessel, 
Um, this type of narrowing, normally cardiologists will deal with it by stenting the, um, this narrowing up and open to kind of hold the vessel apart because aside from the fact that this is a collagen rich environment, this shear stress will immediately activate platelets. And um, in a coronary vessel or a cerebral vessel, this is um, disastrous. So that would result in a heart attack, a myocardial infarct, or in a, a stroke. So some of the other consequences of um, exposure of platelets to shear, apart from uh, activation and degranulation, is the triggering of metalloproteolytic loss of adhesion receptors. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what that means. Also, just firstly, to snapshot what I've been talking about, this is a complex pathway that can be broken down in these simple diagrams to go from um, a free platelet through to a, a an activation um, dependent aggregate. Both of these events occur in normal hemostasis. So part of the normal clotting process that we all undergo all the time, the normal hemostasis process to maintain blood volume, those same events occur in a prothrombotic environment. Um, yeah, so the receptors that we look at here, and I'm going to discuss some of the, the um, shedding of, of these receptors and how sort of a mechanism by which this triggering pathway can be controlled. So these receptors are super critical for triggering the activation events. And um, one consequence of those activation events is that the platelet can feed back and cleave, can cut the ectodomains that bind the ligands, for example. So all of glycoprotein 1B alpha, glycoprotein 5, um, glycoprotein 6 can all be cleaved as part of this activation process. So it's extremely rapid um, and it's irreversible. I've just listed up here some of the other um, important vascular ligands, which also can engage um, some of these receptors. And so you can imagine if um, the metalloproteolytic process is um, undergone, then this um, platelet is now unable to bind a host of receptors, not only von Willebrand factor, which is the primary receptor in the, in the case of 1B95, but now the platelet can also have limited engagement with all of these other vascular and coagulation um, proteins. Likewise, I, I have a quick question. This just just for for this sake. Sorry to interrupt, but um, I guess from the audience, what's what's the difference in coagulation? I guess the, the left hand side of the diagram. Um, so, yeah. Is it because the flow changes or yeah? Coagulation is refers to plasma based generation of thrombin. And so in our plasma, we have all the components to trigger um, formation of thrombin. So this, right. this process really, um, it, to go ahead normally, requires generation of thrombin. And if we have an activated platelet there and some of these receptors which bind to some of these um, important coagulation partners, it goes even more rapidly. And I it's see. more localized too. So it becomes localized at the site of injury as opposed to, you know, disseminated and, and everywhere. Um, so this is a, it's a mechanism of control. I see. And, and I guess the second diagram shows the importance of turbulent. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. So um, laminar flow, you know, such as here, um, platelets can sense it, not even just the narrowing, but just at alterations to the laminar flow. Um, will uh, disturb the platelets enough that they will begin to activate. I see. Thanks. Yeah. So I, um, my group and uh, several other groups around the world identified that one consequence of exposure of um, platelets to collagen and uh, or, or um, mimics of collagen, so uh, proteins that mimic the action of collagen binding to glycoprotein 6, results in the cleavage of glycoprotein 6 in this Western block and the liberation of the ectodomain portion. So summarizing a number of years work into one slide, we identified the cleavage site within glycoprotein 6 is down at the um, juxtamembrane position in, in a point just here. And we know the sequence at which um, the GP6 is cleaved 
in response to activation by, for example, collagen. In, an, in separate work, we identified that the nature of that, the, the enzyme that cleaves this sequence within glycoprotein 6 here is ADAM10. So this is a family of A disintegrin and metalloprotease um, family members. ADAM10 is present on the platelet surface. And so it's able to, under conditions of activation, but not under resting conditions, you can see there's an absence of, of cleavage of GP6 in uh, resting platelets, but under conditions of activation, we can uh, activate ADAM10 to now cleave a, a sequence within glycoprotein 6. Um, there's just some details of the process. Um, probably the most relevant thing to keep in mind is that uh, it doesn't require activation of that integrin, so it does require signaling pathways. So tyrosine kinase activation, we need to engage the receptor trigger those signaling pathways um, because we can block shedding by uh, blocking some of those signaling events, but we don't need the integrin. That final step of ag aggregation is not necessary for, um, for the cleavage event to occur. And so uh, that was all looking uh, at treating platelets with a ligand. And so now in the laboratory, we can artificially expose um, a platelet suspension to shear stress. And here using uh, flow cytometry as a readout, and now we're measuring glycoprotein six levels on the platelet um, under conditions of uh, exposure to two minutes, six minutes, or 10 minutes of a relatively high shear stress. You can see that we lose the glycoprotein six from the surface of the platelet. And we, um, we developed an assay where we can measure that shed fragment in a soluble glycoprotein 6, we call it. It's a little ELISA. And so under those conditions where we lose in blue the um, platelet um, receptor, we gain the uh, soluble GP6 fragment by ELISA. So we can see here that um, in two different uh, assays, we can demonstrate shear-induced loss of um, of glycoprotein 6. So that just means engagement of the platelet um, by fluid shear stress can trigger this, this shedding event, which is very intriguing for us um, in, what, in, in terms of the next experiments that I'm going to show you. So uh, Liz, just one, one quick question. When you say shedding, uh, I guess uh, for the audience, do, do you mean that the, it loses fragments from the membrane? What, what, perhaps we can explain that shedding. Yeah, it means, um, so the receptor sits in the membrane and stretches away from the platelet. So this would be the inside part of the platelet. Right, I see, right. Collagen binds to the receptor here. I see. Um, and triggers signaling responses, which feed back to ADAM10. So sorry, I, I, for simplicity, I didn't sort of draw, um, add in one of the big diagrams. And right. this the ADAM10 is able to cleave a sequence here. So, so, so I guess the, the, the physical properties or the physical consequence of shedding is that, that it loses the, that, that molecule at the, at the, the, at the surface, right? right? Yeah. yeah. The, right. So the it's, it's almost body. like it's, it's lost, uh, I don't know, a hair or some sort, right? That's right. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly yeah. it. So yeah. it's lost its responsiveness to collagen. And, you know, when this right. happens in, in a platelet. I see. Thanks. So just um, we're working at uh, this is just to give some idea of the shear rates that I'm talking about. <clears throat> so um, the larger the artery, the, the lower the shear because that diameter is much larger. So the shear is, is less. Um, smaller vessels, arterioles and veins can have um, increased levels of shear stress and stenotic vessels. So this is where I've, I've spent quite a bit of time looking at people with cardiovascular um, uh, coronary vessels that are stenosed or closed down, the shear rates can be extraordinary. And just for reference, a left ventricular assist device, which is given to someone as a bridge to a cardiac transplant, will, so this is a small pump, pump that um, basically takes over the activities of the um, heart, will, he, um, will expose blood to extremely high um, um, wall shear rates. So this is, it's quite amazing. That, it, this kind of tells you that the platelet can cope with a range of um, shear rates 
And people getting LVADs are generally people that have almost no um, pulse at all. The heart, it's got a failing heart. And so the heart is unable to um, pump blood. There's almost no pulse. There's almost no shear rate. And then, so the cardiologist will implant a, an LVAD device. So um, it just tells you that the blood, which hadn't seen any shear for days, weeks, months, immediately can cope with these extremely elevated shear rates. Of course, they're on antiplatelet drugs as well, um, you know, to help control it. But um, suffice to say, the platelet is a robust and very adaptable um, blood entity. So sorry to in interrupt again. Uh, so when, when you say that the, the shear, the, the platelet copes with it, do you mean that they don't, they don't I guess they don't aggregate as, right. as, as quickly? Is that what is right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we can see evidence of some sort of activation, but um, yeah, they're not, they're not clumping together. I see, right. Um, but they, yeah, there are uh, significant antiplatelet um, agents that are given to the patients get receiving an LVAD. So they'd be on aspirin and uh, probably clopidogrel once the LVAD device is, is inserted. But many people now live with these devices, interestingly enough. So they are seen as a bridge to transplant, but not everyone gets a transplant. Some people just live with the LVAD device. Uh, I, I, sorry to interrupt again. I think uh, Mike has got an interesting question uh, just just yep. at this point. I think because I think you've covered very nice biology, and I think his question was why does increased shear stimulate clotting? I would have thought that wound sites would not be associated to high flow. Yeah. yeah um, so it depends, of course, where the wound is, um, uh, Michael. The it kind of gets back to Steve's question around um, uh, turbulent flow versus laminar flow. And so just even subtle changes to that, the blood vessel, um, the endothelium lining the blood vessel, the platelet can sense that. So actually your question is one that is a major question in the field. How does a platelet actually sense that? And so I suspect it's these receptors that detect the shear change and um, trigger these signaling pathways. But we, yeah, we actually don't know what is the shear sensor um, on the platelet. It could also be something like a calcium flux. So platelets are full of calcium, which is um, being released up, up, upon platelet activation. And so um, shear stress may trigger um, calcium release, which also triggers uh, platelet activation or further platelet activation. Um, Michael, does that help with your question? I hope. Yeah. I guess you can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Okay. So, um, to begin to evaluate uh, this whole pathway in um, uh, closer molecular detail, and actually to bring shear into the equation, to begin to understand basically Michael's question of. of how does um, shear uh, control platelet function? I've been working in these types of setups where um, we draw some healthy donor blood. Generally, we've blocked thrombin um, generation by adding a reagent that inhibits thrombin generation, such as hiridin here, but there's several others. Um, and then before I met Steve, passing um, uh, the blood across a collagen coated uh, uh, slide or um, cover slip or a, um, into a channel and using confocal microscopy to evaluate what's actually happening in real time. Um, but now um, I'll show you a little bit of what Steve um, has brought into our lab. And um, so I list other, uh, other microscopes. Um, and to begin to look at in molecular detail at what's happening here and actually to begin to get at that question of, right, we, we know exposure to collagen generates loss of the receptors. We know exposure to shear generates loss of the receptors. So in this type of scenario, we have both. We have collagen on the surface and we have shear and we can control that, um, the shear rate. We can, um, you know, manipulate the channels. And I really to begin to get at that question of how or, or on what, um, how does 
metalloproteolysis of these receptors control the size of the thrombus. So working with um, engineers, both at Monash and um, here at ANU, we can take um, uh, imaging data, so confocal Z-stacks in, in the old school, but now um, working with Steve's group, other types of imaging modalities, we can reconstruct thrombi and begin to look at growth and loss of, um, of a, uh, a thrombus in real time. So this is um, essentially what it looks like um, down a microscope. This is a collagen coated surface. And I'm just looking, uh, this is with a very basic um, you know, bright field um, illumination. And so we can see here the small strands of collagen, and this is passing whole blood over that collagen surface. So this hasn't been sped up at all. This is real time what happens um, you know, so when I say it's a rapid event, it is an extremely rapid event. And we can see here, you know, the blood is full of red cells, white cells and platelets, but it's only the platelets that are adhering under um, what's a pretty decent um, shear rate, 1800 inverse seconds, and um, holding on to the collagen and then um, being recruited into little clumps. So we can see it's fast, specific, and very controlled. So it's in the absence of thrombin, we can see here forming a platelet aggregate is extremely controlled. You can speed it up a little bit. And you can see, you know, this, I think it runs for three or four minutes, this uh, video. Um, and these are quite stable thrombi um, that, that will sit here as long as necessary. So to summarize, um, platelets are born out of the bone marrow from a parental cell of metacaryocyte. Oh, sorry, I didn't mention that. They circulate through um, the vasculature. They, if they find a prothrombotic surface, such as exposed collagen, they're induced to uh, aggregate and, and form aggregates. If this happens too exuberantly, um, is, it's a condition called thrombosis, such as in a DVT. Um, or if it doesn't happen um, appropriately or well enough, this leads to bleeding and generally bleeding with um, of clinical significance requiring surgery or you know surgery if you're lucky enough to get to the hospital in time. So this is the system that we've been using um, in collaboration with uh, Monash University engineers, Josie Carberry and her group. We were initially um, passing collagen um, uh, it's, sorry, uh, heridinated whole blood across uh, surfaces coated with collagen where we artificially induce different size stenoses. And we can see here how we're adjusting the wall shear rate by simply um, narrowing that the lumen of, of the, the vessel. And just in a very simple experiment, this is a single donor um, on a straight channel with no stenoses, we can measure a thrombus height of seven to eight microns of that person. These are DIOC6 labeled platelets. If we put that same donor's platelets on the same day through a separate chip with a stenosis, we can see that the stenotic um, interval has induced 7.7 um, .7 micron height thrown by here, similar to the straight channel but immediately prior to the uh, stenosis and then after the stenosis, thrombi, thrombi of um, much greater heights. So this is telling us already that there's molecular events going on that are purely influenced by simply altering the rheology of the, um, of the microchip. Well, um, just a quick question. Uh, so that, that model that you and Josie have done, is that to mimic the um, the, the, the sort of um, uh, plaque formation process, yes, right? Yeah, so okay. a narrow, simply a narrowing or, or disturbing of that laminar flow, yeah. Right, okay. Um, and the other information that we, we uh, have been working with Josie's group, uh, in particular Isaac Kanar, is to um, look at thrombi that have formed and begin to uh, measure the shear rate on the surface of the platelet. This is again, getting at the question of what's happening to the receptors on this thrombus that has um, formed on collagen, but then been exposed to shear. And so we can see here um, differences in the shear rates across the, 
surface of the thrombus. Again, this is an input at 1800 inverse seconds, but you can see once the thrombi form, it disturbs the flow itself. And also information about regions of growth or loss um, from that thrombus. And so that's work that I've really continued with Steve Lee and his group with Yuji Zeng to begin to understand where is the susceptible part of the thrombus, the one, the part that's going to be destabilized, that's going to break off and potentially cause um, major clinical problems such as a heart attack or a, or a stroke. So um, yeah, so work in our group has been uh, focused on trying to correlate these areas of shear rate and of growth and loss. Um, so where blue equals a loss um, with um, metalloprotease activity and receptor density. Um, so just to show you what I mean about uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the way glycoprotein 6, so this is the collagen receptor, GP6. Um, this is a thrombus, a thrombus formed under, uh, on collagen under just a regular shear rate. And the platelets were pre-stained with um, uh, an anti glycoprotein 6 antibody fab fragment, and it's coloured in blue. And now this is just a set of Z stacks knitted together into a, a video just to show um, the distribution of glycoprotein 6 through that thrombus. So I'll just let it run a couple of times, just it goes for about um, a Z stack of about 30. And now we just pause and we can see here that there's regions, this is sectioning up. So we're about, we're four microns above the surface. There's regions that are enriched for glycoprotein 6 and there's regions that are devoid, suggesting, and so all platelets have the same amount of GP6 in a healthy donor. So it's suggesting that there's a regulation that's going on um, in this thrombus. So, and so, um, so there's just a quick question. So the, in this, I guess, for the audience, there's, there's a lot of aggregates. So we're not looking at just one platelet. This, yeah. this is a lot of platelets aggregating. That's and right. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Please keep um, reminding me when uh, I'm skipping over important details. Yeah. Uh, as we section up, you know, past sort of seven micron, um, we the spread of glycoprotein six seems to become more um, homogeneous. Yeah. But this requires further um, further analysis, and we would like to do it. Um, coincidental with a with a FREC tool that we have in the lab that can measure the atom activity as well. So the atom that's causing that cleavage of GP6, we want to be able to simultaneously um, measure those two activities. Anyway, so um, the same um, event uh, of sh receptor shedding occurs for the glycoprotein 1B alpha subunit of glycoprotein 1B95. Um, and using that setup uh, where we've stained platelets with DROC6, just an intracellular um, stain, and then surface antibodies against glycoprotein 1B alpha or anti GP6, we can see regions um, that are where these two receptors are differentially regulated. So if we merge the, all three images um, and then remove the uh, green uh, material, we can see that they're are distinct areas that are enriched for the VWF receptor, but not for glycoprotein 6 and vice versa. So glycoprotein 6 seems to be lost in the internal part of the thrombus. And this fits nicely with um, published work from other groups that have identified um, a P-selectin exposure down in um, at the site of injury uh, you know, so platelets have P-selectin in, in the granules. And so when P-selectin is exposed on the surface and detected, um, it's found to be enriched in this area and less so here, implying that these uh, platelets are less activated on the uh, top of the, on the top of the thrombus. Um, and this whole concept of a shell and a core region of a thrombus is beginning to emerge. And this is really important for a whole host of reasons, because these are the, the um, for example, a DVT or a thrombus that's embedded, the doctor wants to be able to know how to dissolve this thrombus. And so if we can provide better tools 
that, for example, could stabilize the shell so that it doesn't embolize and move off and create major problems in the lungs or the, the brain or the heart. Um, and then uh, the porosity of this thrombus is, would be very important to understand if we can design drugs and delivery modalities that can get into this core region, we would have better ways of, of uh, dissolving blood clots and, um, and uh, you know, treating people um, with these conditions. So um, maybe uh, let's just go one step back. I, I just, I think perhaps you could, um, I guess, I guess D, um, DVT, it's probably not a familiar term for everyone in, the, in, in this audience. So maybe you can illustrate yeah. the, um, you know, the health consequence of, of you know, stroke yeah. based on this. And, yeah. yeah, it's um, super important. You know, people, anyone taking a long haul flight, such as I am tomorrow, um, would uh, be at risk of deep vein thrombosis. So it's due to a stasis in the blood flow. Fit young people generally don't even ever have to worry about it. With people that are older with you know, maybe poorer um, vascularization, poor lymphatic activity, um, sitting for 14 hours on a plane and not moving, for example, is um, a, a, a major risk factor for um, uh, forming a DVT, which would be lower leg pain generally, not always, but generally lower leg pain. And um, it, uh, it, if it stays local in the leg, it's very painful for the person, but it's probably something that can be um, dealt with and, um, and treated. The problem is if it becomes mobile, if, it, if a piece breaks off um, and travels up either to the lungs, that's a pulmonary embolism, or to the heart or to a cerebral vessel, that's a heart attack or, um, or a stroke. So all of those, in all of those scenarios, the blood clot would block the flow of blood to a very important organ, and this is catastrophic. Um, so, so, so I guess coming from that question, uh, that, or the, the statement you made, is the shell that's really quite difficult to, to, yeah. to get a handle off, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to, if you like, stabilise it or learn how to stabilise it, maybe put a fibrin mesh over it. Um, often they do have a fibrin mesh, but there's, you know, in our body we have a clotting program and a dis dissolution program, and they, they work together with the fibrinolysis component to, to destroy a blood clot kicks into action straight away. So actually we may want to control that so that we don't, um, you know, break off parts of, of a thrombus. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so just moving along a little bit, Steve asked me just to mention some super resolution data and, and there's a bunch of people that have done some beautiful work looking at um, platelet and thrombus formation using super res. Um, this was some work that I was involved in um, where uh, the, the, the people used my antibody. Sorry, I forgot to put a, um, uh, I forgot to put the citation. This is Poulter et al. in Journal of Thrombosis Hemostasis and Natalie Poulter performed all this work. Um, looking at uh, platelets adhering to collagen, it's called horn collagen. So this is essentially collagen or fibrinogen um, under uh, turf um, and D-storm modalities. And then we were interested just to understand differences in how the platelet, which adheres to both of these um, proteins, what happens to some of the receptors. And so um, the work that I was interested in was looking at how what happens to glycoprotein 6. And we can see here that um, platelets sitting on collagen the glycoprotein 6 light seems to line up on the collagen strands, indicating a clustering effect and um, a dimerization effect. Um, a different type of collagen, uh, collagen 3, so horn collagen is, is type 2, but um, uh, or a mixture of type 2 and type 4. Collagen type 3, different structure. The platelets do adhere, but they respond differently. Likewise, we can see signaling events emanating after engagement of um, the platelet uh, on the collagen, um, and these coincide. So these would relate to those signaling events that I was talking about. So um, this is all uh, 
good academic information, looking at the behaviour of one of the key receptors involved in initiating um, a platelet response. This is just in under static conditions, so that's one disadvantage of um, super res. Um, to, to date, that no one's been able to uh, build a shear, uh, uh, the ability to um, invoke shear in the experimental setup and then use super resolution microscopy. However, I think um, this is a, a goal that Steve has for his group, um, and I'll let him talk about it more in the discussion. Um, and the other aspect of work that we're interested in is getting towards that uh, clot dissolution. And I can just show some um, work that we've done, uh, collaborators of mine uh, over in France in Strasbourg, principally Pierre Mangan, is looking at uh, dissolution of thrombi. So using a similar sort of setup, adhesion um, at this time on fibrinogen. So just pause it here and we can see we've got a control or an antibody treated. So AX17 is an antibody against glycoprotein 6. And we've preformed thrombi at a, a low shear rate and we can see them here. And then we're going to pass either a control antibody or this anti-GP6 antibody across, um, across the fluid chip. And we can, um, we, we can see the thrombi remain stable in the control conditions, but we can get a loosening of that shell region um, in the, in the um, chip treated with the anti-GP6 antibody. So, you know, this would be an important sort of first step to begin to look at controlling that core versus shell um, uh, uh, architecture of, of a thrombus. Um, so this is with uh, Martin jandrock Peru's antibody, and I'm proud to say that one of the antibodies that we make here, this is my antibody, 1G5, does the same thing. So we potentially have um, an antithrombotic or, um, you know, the, the makings of an antithrombotic um, sitting in our lab, which we're very excited about and we're likely to put a patent through um, soon on, on this. So I won't trouble you with all this detail. People in my lab group will want to know about controls and um, is, is this antibody engaging with another receptor? But suffice to say, um, 1G5, the anti-GP6 antibody that we have, can, um, can perform this clot dissolution. I'll just run the video one more time. <clears throat> so we get the forming of the thrombi. Um, and then switch over to a buffer containing antibody and we can see a liberation of at least the external part of the thrombus. So, so, uh, so let's just going back, when, when that happens, that doesn't mean that the hairs are uh, gone quickly. So that the, on the hairs of the platelet, yeah. so the now, yeah. are gone. Yeah. We're disturbing the function of that of GP6. So GP6 binds collagen. I've talked about that. It actually yeah. also binds fibrin, and right. so we actually think we're disturbing GP6 fibrin interactions, which is stabilizing that shell region. I see. Um, yeah. So th this is um, we've published this small amount of work, but yeah, this needs a lot more work. It needs a lot more antibody too. <laughs> yeah, these um, are antibody rich experiments, and so. Steve Lee, Pierre and I um, have a grant together where we're going to treat mice that are humanized for the GP6 and 1B receptors so that the platelets have the human forms and we're going to test these um, antibodies in, in mice. Um, and so this is some now some work that I'm really proud to have been involved with, uh, driven by Yuji Zeng, in, a PhD student in Steve Lee's group getting away from the need to label uh, the platelets. And so what we have um, is uh, the COSY system, which is a combination of uh, digital holographic microscopy and um, rotational optic coherent scattering to begin to look at fundamentally what is happening down on the edge of that, that forming that adherent platelet. So this is uh, one of Yuji's um, uh, movies looking at the uh, uh, height map of an adherent platelet. It's adherent on collagen. Um, and then uh, scattering data. And uh, remind me, 
Steve, can you remember what this was that fibrin? Fibrin called it. Uh, yeah. um, fibrin called it. Yep. Uh, so I just, yeah. yeah, so this is beautifully articulated in uh, Yuji's uh, recent paper. But just to suffice to say, you know, we can see here that there's regions of activity of alterations to the height and the scattering properties at the edge of the platelet. So this is getting towards what, you know, this is essentially a stable platelet just sitting on collagen, but we've, um, uh, we can detect new molecular activity at that edge. And so that's really what we're focused on. It's label free, which is very important for what I'm going to talk about next. So just to summarize um, lots of words on the slide, but essentially I'm trying to put across this idea that using imaging, we've been able to identify um, a core versus shell regions um, uh, where, you know, GP6 has multiple ro roles in that thrombus, firstly to adhere to collagen, but then also to um, engage with um, <clears throat> fibrinogen and fibrin and I really try to hold this shell together. Okay, so <clears throat> what does all this have to do with uh, clinical um, uh, uh, clinical links? And so I'll tell you just a couple of vignettes around um, some of the other work that I've got going in the lab where <clears throat> we were able to identify that this receptor, glycoprotein 6, that binds fibrin and collagen, has a sister receptor that looks very similar to IgG domain protein, sits in the membrane of a platelet, has many of the same signaling um, properties and pathways, and interestingly is also cleaved, but that's by the by. But um, engagement of this receptor also triggers shedding of GP6. Um, there, there's probably some sort of cooperativity that we have that, that, that is occurring here. We don't fully understand it. This is an immune cell receptor termed FC gamma R2A. It's only on human platelets. It's not on mouse platelets, but it has important roles in um, pathology. So most famously, this receptor is at the heart of a um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. It's termed HIT. So this is a syndrome that people, um, <clears throat> and we can't identify ahead of time who's going to be uh, subjected to um, uh, or afflicted with HIT. People that receive heparin in a hospital setting can generate an antibody against um, heparin in the context of an activated platelet. So one of the constituents of, of a granule, a platelet granule is something called platelet factor four, PF4, platelet factor four, it's a tetramer, and it is extremely positively charged. And in the presence of a negatively charged macromolecule such as heparin, or, and for example, and relevant to the next couple of slides, an adenoviral vaccine, platelet factor four on an activated platelet can form an antigenic complex that be, for whatever reason we don't understand, becomes autoantigenic. So that means in certain people where this structure is allowed to form in the appropriate stoichiometry, the person will raise an antibody. That antibody engages with its antigen on the platelet surface and can in, then engage FC gamma R2A. And so um, lots of people raise these antibodies and they're not pathological. We don't understand why that is. Lots of people raise the antibody um, or people don't raise the antibody and, um, but still have evidence of platelet activation. So there's a quandary in the clinic around how do we identify who is the person that has the pathological antibody? So people will raise an antibody, we can measure it, we can measure the antibody, but we don't know if it's actually going to engage FC MRR 2 a because there's many properties within the patient, that, um, the context, why did the patient get the heparin in the first place, that contribute to whether the antibody that's raised is pathological. And this has enormous clinical implications because pretty much, I don't think there's any surgeons online, surgeons generally want to operate with heparin on board, okay? They don't want any other anticoagulant. They understand heparin. They've got a lot of confidence in heparin. This is worldwide. 
Heparin is the choice of anticoagulant for all surgery. So in people that are needing surgery, such as the reason why they had the heparin, um, they're at risk. It's a small risk, but it's an identifiable risk that they'll raise an antibody. And why does that become a problem? So because if a pathological antibody to heparin is raised, this causes blood clotting. So the engagement of FC gamma R2A -A leads to activation, aggregation, thrombosis, and importantly for our work, release of soluble GP6. So if you like, this could be a marker of a pathological antibody. So um, keeping in mind, lots of people raise antibodies, but because of this stoichiometry is being exquisitely important, um, they, it may not result in engagement of this receptor pathway leading to thrombosis, but the clinician doesn't know that and has no ability to detect. All they have is a bunch of immunoassays that can measure the antibody, and lots of people raise antibodies to heparin platelet factor 4, but they're not pathological. They have um, patient-specific factors that they can look at, um, and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is more commonly found in trauma or for what for some reason heart surgery probably related to disturbance of the vascular space endothelial perturbation release of platelet factor four and if it's in the right set of circumstances it can result in thrombosis and um, or thrombocytopenia first and then thrombosis um, these types of uh, assays that uh, that can help a clinician really don't exist outside the research clinic. And that's measuring a, a, the platelet activating potential of the antibody, the platelet reactivity, and also another um, patient parameter, which is um, the phenotype, the genetic phenotype of the receptor. Not important for today's talk. So I just wanted, you know, the challenge for the clinician is um, that the, the platelet count might drop for any number of reasons but they won't necessarily think of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia until it's too late. So this really um, exemplifies the challenge. This is a patient. This looking um, so at the let's just, just a uh, quick question. Can we go back one slide? Uh, it's it's pretty dense. Uh, I, I guess from, from my very naive perspective is over here, you've shown a lot of imaging data from before that informs you right. on the dynamics. And I guess what uh, we're looking at here when you're saying immunoassays are just typically uh, flow cytometry readouts. Is, is that correct? No, immunoassays are ELISAs. Yeah. All right, I see. Elizas, so really... um, particle gel assays. So right. these are, um, they're easy to do, but they're not very informative. They just tell you whether the antibody's there or not. What we That's actually it. want is an, a functional assay with the patient's own blood. That's what that would be the ultimate goal to be able to detect um, heparin induced um, thrombocytopenia or um, other sorts of um, uh, vaccine induced thrombocytopenia, for example. So just yes, stick with me. This is the platelet count of a patient who was in for a, just a standard surgery, diverticulitis, so, um, you know, an operation on the, the stomach area, and they received heparin very normal heparin response. And this is their platelet count. The normal range for platelets is between 150 and 400. So sitting up in this level, absolutely no problem. Always a little bit of a dip when they had a surgery and then a, a, a rebound um, a recovery of the platelet count. On about day nine, she got a blood infection. Okay, so she was had positive blood cultures. The platelet count began to drop. The doctors are, oh, well, you know, she's got a blood infection, this is the issue. Keep the heparin up, no problem, because we need, and we'll start getting antibiotics, treating the blood infection. The blood counts have now dropped down to about 50. So she's gone from a platelet count of nearly um, 270 down to 50. And the explanation was that there was this, um, there was a, 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 an infection. A smart person looking after her started to collect um, samples and then at about day um, 22, 23, when they're worried about um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, they perform the only assay that they have available using donor platelets where they simply add the patient's plasma that contains an antibody 
two donor platelets and then look at what happens. And lo and behold, it turns out she had an a, an antibody to heparin platelet factor four. So these are the curves that are just measuring the heparin, uh, the antibody, two different assays, don't, don't worry. But you can see here that the antibody is most prevalent here when heparin is still being um, given to the patient. It's immediately you find this result, you would switch to a non-heparin anticoagulant, but these results, and this highlights the ch clinical challenge that all of these assays were not done until um, about this day. So the SRA assay was only done three weeks later. And so this lady's had the antigen, she's been given the antigen all the time, and this would have contributed to the, um, the loss of platelets, the continual loss and the onset of, um, of, a, th of a thrombosis which, you know, she went in for a um, diverticulitis and she came out with um, um, more than she bargained for. Um, oh, so I seem to have lost, a, I thought I included another um, slide showing this same profile occurs in people with vaccine-induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. So the, the consequence of receiving the AstraZeneca vaccine is basically the same thing. You, a few days where everything's fine and then a sudden drop and the appearance of, um, of thrombosis. And um, so being able to predict this is highly important. So just in the interest of time, I move on really quick and show that um, the soluble GP6 in people that are positive for HIP is um, through the roof. So this would suggest that we have a, an assay where we can quickly confirm um, that, the, that there is an activating activity triggering release of soluble GP6 um, in, in the blood. Um, and this is not related to a loss of platelet count. So people with chemotherapy related thrombocytopenia um, have normal levels of uh, soluble GP6. So it was only in uh, this cohort where there's an activating antibody that was confirmed um, with SRA. Um, and so this was important in a, a, a separate study that we did of 310 people who were suspected of having HIT. They had a, a thrombocytopenia. We had the opportunity to measure soluble GP6 versus the antibody. And you can, this is the challenge of the antibody. So you can see in 310 people with suspected HIT, most people didn't have an antibody, but an awful lot did, but not all of them had HIT had um, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. So they, they um, were raising antibodies that were not necessarily pathological and using the side-by-side um, -side with the soluble GP6 assay, we'd be able to give, a, a, if you like, a, a second readout of the pathology of an antibody in the patient themselves, as opposed to on donor platelets. Um, and this has real consequences. So releasing soluble GP6 was strongly co correlated with um, patients uh, that were hospitalized with and without bleeding. So in that same cohort of people for query hit, a number of them had bleeding events. And we can see here, even after correcting for um, uh, the type of reason why they were in hospital, uh, the platelet count, um, the... Uh, uh, the, the, the lipids, uh, there was a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, other predictors that we were able to normalize versus the group that didn't show any bleeding and it's to normalize between the group, sorry. And soluble GP6 remained a powerful indicator. So an early indicator of bleeding events um, that some of them were occurring, but others were to occur in the, uh, in the future in these people, probably related to loss of the receptor linking with loss of platelet function. And uh, just finally, um, in, a, in a separate group of trauma patients, so these are essentially well people that have a car accident or you know, tip boiling water on themselves. So, some, so they're essentially well, there's no comorbidities, until they suffer a traumatic event. And so this was in collaboration with a group in London led by Paul Vellandi, where he was able to show that using an adhesion-based assay, adhesion on collagen, um, healthy 
uh, donors could form um, a, a particular area coverage of uh, thrombi, and this was significantly reduced in patients um, and trauma patients with the same platelet count. So this is not related to platelet count. This is something to do with the functionality of the platelets. And it turns out here on the right, we were able to do flow cytometry and we can show loss of platelet glycoprotein 6, increased levels of soluble GP6, normal levels of the integrin, no real change, and loss of the other um, receptor, indicating that um, uh, the, the, almost certainly the metalloregulation of the um, of the, these receptors on the trauma patient platelets had contributed to this lack of functionality and, of course, to, to um, bleeding events. So over here on the left, this is uh, essentially a, 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 a bleeding score where a score of less than 25 versus more, greater than 25, indicates the severity of uh, trauma and particularly where bleeding is a major component. And we can see here that there is a significant increase in soluble GP6, even amongst the trauma patients, the ones that um, have more severe injury. So this just links in the value of reading and understanding platelet functional events for um, the clinician. And so they will be able to use this sort of information to uh, transfuse not just uh, cryoprecipitate or plasma, but to actually provide platelets even though the person doesn't have um, a, a thrombocytopenia. So that's all, it's in, it's in the early stages, but that's where we would um, suggest this work heads. And this is just finally, just uh, some work, um, not from our group, but from a group at UPenn, where they're beginning to model vascular injury on a chip. So real, this is an extremely complicated image, I'm really sorry, but just focus on two points, first of all, in the vasculature, um, what happens in a bleeding event, there's often uh, some type of physical injury, the platelets form a plug. And they wanted to model this. And so they built um, this contraption, which they filled with a hydrogel in the middle. And these three compartments are meant to mimic um, the three compartments of extracellular, blood space, and intracellular, um, or yeah, sorry, intertissue, yeah, extra tissue, intra tissue and then within the uh, blood environment. I think I got, I actually I might have got that right. So that's extra uh, vascular, intravascular um, in, in the blood space and they were passing blood through here. They had to derivatize this uh, collagen gel with tissue factor, which is a coagulant um, uh, part of the coagulation pathway. And then they seeded endothelial cells onto this side. So this sort of mimics an endothelial um, in, in the inner portion of a blood vessel, then the tissues and extra vascular space. So, sorry, um, I've just read this really quickly. They then induce an injury. This is through the blood space. They damage the endothelial, um, uh, the, the endothelium covering this um, hydrogel. The needle goes all the way through, such as here. And then they were able to um, look at what happens. And so I do have one video to show just as the final um, part, but what they compared is blood flowing through here past this site of injury into tissue and then what happens even beyond that. And so that's here on the left-hand side under B, looking at the formation of a platelet plug on the surface of the endothelium. They showed that, that it was critical to have tissue factor present um, in the absence of tissue factor, so in the absence of coagulation, there were not really very competent, but there was platelet adhesion, but there was no full plug formation and covering up of the um, puncture site. And they compared this with an intravascular wound injury in a, in a mouse in the jugular vein, um, where they uh, were able to show this is what their contraption could do was similar to, could mimic what was seen in a in vivo model of, um, of a bleeding event. So just finally, I can show you. Oh, and the, so the other reason that you might want to build one of these devices is for drug um, screening. Oh, sorry. I'm nearly finished, people. Or display. So these are looking at platelets or formation of fibrin. 
So just to orientate you, we're looking straight down at the device. This is the hydrogel here. This is the blood compartment here. And this is the extracellular space. Sorry, I said that incorrectly just at the start. And we're looking at um, in a controlled, uh, just a control environment, if we block thrombin generation or in the presence of um, a, a drug that can interfere with platelet function. So we're looking at the platelets or at fibrin formation here. So I'll just play it again. The blood is here being passed through um, and finds that leakage site, that site of leakage. And you can see that the platelets move into the, uh, the hydrogel, the collagen hydrogel. It's very rich. They'd be very activated. It requires thrombin for that to occur efficiently. And if we include an antiplatelet agent, so this is blocking 2B3A, um, they can model uh, or they can demonstrate um, no platelets moving in. Fibrin is generated as a consequence. Let me just run it one more time. The blood is here, passes through the site of injury, and um, we can look at fibrin generation. In the presence of um, hirudin, there's no fibrin generation in, in the hydrogel channel. Um, and platelets, in, inhibiting the platelets with this drug did not interfere with coagulopathy. So yeah, it seems like a good model. Um, and, uh, you know, they've just published it, or, you know, in the last 12 months in the journal Small. Um, it's possibly something we could look at, Steve. So this is just a quick summary. Metelloproteolysis contributes to disease pathology and imaging um, could be helpful in the acute clinical setting to inform on platelet functionality in the patient. Every, the clinicians have no ability beyond just measuring a platelet count to look at platelet functionality, particularly if there are low platelets, if, if there's a thrombocytopenia. And um, for the researchers amongst us, high-res imaging of thrombosis and hemostatic processes um, provides us with a, a beautiful window to begin to um, unpick some of these molecular events that are, are occurring. So I'll just finish there, happy to take questions. Um, quickly acknowledge um, the work from my group and from Steve's group, um, which has been ongoing for four or five years. I think I've um, acknowledged everyone else. So thanks everyone. Thank you Liz for, for a very nice talk um, that covers you know, clinical settings and, and, and chemistry and imaging. Um, I guess, uh, any questions from the audience? Um, um, so Kayla has a question. Uh, does a high shear rate cause any conformational change, VWF, which would lead to increased binding between them and the corresponding receptors on the platelet? And if yes, can this be changed as part of uh, therapy? Um, to target thrombosis? Yeah. That's a good question, actually. Yeah. That's a great question. And yes, so the answer is yes. VWF does alter its structure in response to shear. Um, and um, it could be targeted. So actually, I have an antibody. I'm involved with a group that have made a, a nanobody from my antibody. So my antibody recognizes an epitope within von Willebrand factor that isn't present on just regular VWF. You have to expose it to shear that opens up the molecule and the epitopes present and this antibody then can bind and interfere with how VWF binds to glycoprotein 1B alpha. So in theory, that's a shear sensitive antithrombotic. Um, yeah, so we have a patent on that and um, trying to get that uh, moved through. It's uh, it's a lot going to be a lifetime work, but that's a great question, Kalo. Yeah. Um, Brendan's got a question. Yeah, yeah hi, Liz. Um, hey. Great work, great work. I'm just wondering in your work, you're looking at shear rate or shear stress effects on platelet activation and, and clot formation. Is there an idea that it's sort of a, I guess, kind of a, a threshold effect where there's a certain point where shear becomes activatable and below that there's not? Or is it sort of a kind of a Rio stat where there's just a general increase in some yeah. sort of relationship? I think it's got to be, um, there's got to be a level of quiescence. So there's got to be some breaks holding everything in place so that a platelet can go through a high shear environment in a capillary 
as well as through a, a large vessel and not activate. Um, yeah, we don't really understand what how that works, what's controlling it. Um, the most recent work from our group has shown that uh, if you expose platelets to steady shear, you can, you'll get platelet aggregates forming. And if you expose them to pulsatile shear, so actually a better mimic of what the platelet's probably feeling in the blood vessel, you actually get smaller platelets, uh, smaller thrombi, sorry. So um, it would suggest, even though you would think, oh, pulsatile flow, that would be a bigger um, agonist, Actually, it, in our hands, it seems to form smaller aggregates. And it's probably related to some sort of thrombostasis that the platelet has. Yeah, that ability yeah, it's, it's, to not just clump. Yeah, but we so don't understand it, it. Yeah, I mean, that's really fascinating. I, I just thought exactly the same thing. Post pulsatile flow might actually be less stimulatory, but you know, the biology underlying that just seems really quite fascinating to understand what. But it yeah. regulates that, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, the, the systems you've got in place seem to be great tools to be able to, to look Hopefully. at that now. So. Yeah. so, I didn't mention any of Daniel's work where he can induce um, structures into a, 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 a capillary tube. So, he can actually draw whatever we want in a capillary tube using, you know, um, UV activated hydrogels, create little blocks or little disturbances in the flow, and we should be able to address. Those sorts of questions. Yeah. Um, any questions? Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks. This is thanks for the informative talk and the excellent summary. So I I, I don't have a medical background, so maybe my my question quite naive. <laughs> so bear with me. So um so the image you show in your presentation. So are those from in vivo or in vitro? So when I when I mention in vivo, are those uh the image directly from the patient or you just like take the blood sample and the test in the yeah. lab? It's all blood samples, yeah. Um, not, none of the data I showed is imaging the patient in vivo. Um, but, you know, there's that's a whole different talk. Um, you know, so they can do Doppler and, and ultrasound imaging for the thrombosis that the slide that I forgot to add actually was talking about that was the way they diagnose people with vaccine induced thrombosis by whether there's an a thrombus present to that they can image yeah but everything I showed is in vitro I see that's amazing even in vitro it still show the dynamics formation mm. of some bus yeah, so that's been a focus of Steve and our group to sort of put something onto the size of a shoebox or, you know, a large shoebox that can be wheeled on a cart to, to a patient's bedside. And, um, you know, not just assess platelet number, but assess the functionality. That's what's important. Um, you know, the ability of the platelet to respond. I see. Because I, I, I came from image uh, field, I'm interested in, so you mentioned you collaborate with Steve, so using digital holographic microscope and also the rotation optical coherent scattering microscope. I was just mm -hmm. wondering in general, so what's the challenge to image? So those dynamic processing and why use those two methods? So what's the advantage? Um, I probably could answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so I think uh, the two methods are label free and contrast. Um, so uh, you know, taking advantage of scattering. So light scattering is a lot higher for the ROCS. So almost like a dark field approach. And with dark field, you typically use white field, white sort of broadband source. So you don't get as much contrast with almost a, um, you know, the rotational scattering, which is basically a dark field reflectance method, the contrast is much higher. Um, that's one side of the label free. Um, the other side of the label free, which is the DHM, um, that's the shoe box that Liz and I have been collaborating on, is that you can take blood, so not label the cells. Um, literally on the day we collect, we run blood through the sample and collect volume data. So we can characterize the thrombus 
in, in, a, in a more um, compact manner. So we can actually see the whole chip up to centimeter long and see different types of architecture. So we want to analyze the architecture of the thrombus. So the DHM, a very fast readout. So it's very quick. You don't have to do confocal stacks and you just get the structure. So if I understand you correctly, so when you mention scattering, so even the in vitro sample show great scattering. Show yeah, yeah, which is which is quite interesting because uh, from where the, the source of scattering is, uh, we believe is actin being aggregated at the leading and the real edge of the platelet. So that that aggregation of actin that's polymerized, it's as they are forming filopodium and lamopodium. That's where the source of scattering comes from. I see. So back to Elisper's uh, presentation. So Elisper's at the end of your presentation, you mentioned you measure 310 patients. So, mm. okay. So I'm curious, how long did the measurement take in total? <laughs> ah, well, so we can batch analyze. So that we were measuring um, uh, soluble GP6 and we can do that very quickly. In a fact, so it was. It did. It takes a while, but it's. Um, we can do it. You know, we can freeze the sample. So that's not looking at the platelet. So the trauma study, the final one that I showed, that took a while because that is individual patients. Um, and you know, the guy, the lead guy, was also the the um, intensive care, uh, not into sorry, emergency room doctor. So he was. He was literally treating the patient and then going and doing the um, adhesions under flow. Um, that was very challenging for him. Um, so how, that how long, I guess, is it how many years was that? Oh, that so that was basically his whole PhD. Um, oh. I think he probably did the patients in about two years, across two years. Oof. Yes, because you have to get the right patients as well. And you have to get them. First of all, he had to be the treating physician, and then he had to have a blood sample before they got transfused because they all would get um, uh, cryoprecipitate because they're worried about bleeding, right? So the, they all would have had cryoprecipitate. Um, so they had normal platelet count, but um, worried about no fibrinogen or lack of coagulopathy going on. So, so that, that's one person doing all that. Well, you know, I mean, he was probably part of a team in the emergency right. room. Yeah, but, um, wow. but you know, if someone comes in and everyone, you like, you, you treat them immediately. So the challenge is to get that sample before they give them, um, you know, any transfusion product, which you can imagine, you know, it, it takes a few minutes to do, but you've got to consent the family as well. Um, yeah, so it, it's... It was hard for him. Cool. Um, yeah. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> Thanks for the answer. Uh, so Thank Michael's you. got a question. Hi, Michael. Hi. Um, I was just earlier on in the talk, you were showing some pictures with the uh, uh, rheometer. And I'm yep. kind of wondering how that fits in, because the group that I'm in, we have confocal rheometer. So a confocal microscope built on one of these Anton power things. Oh. And um, in the event where, that- Where did you buy that from? Where did you... it, it's, so it's custom made. So you've got a commercial okay. Anton power rheometer and a commercial Leica uh, confocal microscope. And they've just been modified to be compatible with one another. Right. Um, so this is up in University of Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can see that the flow things are probably more physiologically relevant and all that, but I did notice that you had your cone rheometer and testing those things. And uh, I wasn't sure if that was directly relevant because you didn't come back to it, but. No, well, I, did, well, I mean, we've got a bunch of work that we've shown. Um, so the advantage of the rheometer is just to, as you would know, apply a uniform Shear, like a very controlled yep. shear, and no need for any other ligand. So we can get at, you know, um, shear induced platelet activation in the absence of having to add collagen or, or anything else. So yeah. And you can also measure the changing uh, mechanical properties as, as things are responding. 
Yeah, so I would we would um, expose plate, a platelet suspension to shear and then sample what's in the supernatant and what what's on the platelet surface. So yeah, we can do those sorts of measurements. We yeah, but we can't look at adhesion. I mean, we can form a thrombus, okay, but it it's different and doesn't have that um, that information. So actually, what we want to do, Michael, is measure side by side. Um, a blood donor's response in a rheometer and then under Steve's system of looking at uh, adhesion under flow. And I suspect they will be different. I suspect there'll okay. be differences, yeah. But what, what, are you, what, what are you doing? Um, what are you exposing to shear and then looking at? What's well, okay, in, in our lab, we're doing mostly hydrogel stuff. Uh, this is including fibrin. So we're doing a little, it's tangentially related to I mean, you're looking at the platelets. The fibrin is also part of the wound healing cascade. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a um, Are you working with Andreas Serbia? I'm working with Alan Rowan, and okay. I don't know who Andreas Serbia is. Oh, he's also. Um, a um, but I, I'm not really, I'm not really involved with that part of the lab's work. But I'm kind of more familiar with it. I just thought that could be an interesting thing to explore if yeah. if. If you can start initiating things, and because your rheometer is keeping things sitting still, you have your higher resolution imaging of the confocal, and um, yeah, you could yeah, talk about that more separately if yeah. oh, that's be, interesting. Hear what you're doing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for um, uh, thanks for speaking up. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks, Michael. Um, if not, uh, there's no more questions. I think um, thanks, Liz, for the talk. It's been very enlightening, um, covering many areas of throm thrombosis and platelet. Um, all right, thank you, everyone, and um, have a good holiday ahead. And I think yeah. we'll convene back in uh, January. All right, see have you. A good day. Thanks. Happy see you. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Dave. Right. Bye. Bye.